I'm going to talk a few uh, general things at the start. Uh, as most of you know, sci and I won't read this verbatim, but science advance, uh, advances through publication, peer review, and everything like that. This has all been going on for several hundred years, and it works pretty well. Uh, so the whole point is people have to be, replicate, be able to replicate experimental findings, and this distinguishes science from other types of intellectual activity. Uh, there are many things that can affect uh, outcomes of experiments, uh, different reagents, methods, resources. Some of this is hard to uh, um, uh, avoid, particularly in biology, because in general biology can show more fluctuation than, in, for instance, in chemistry, and many of these things can affect experimental outcomes. Uh, there have been um, a number of recent well-publicized allegations of the inability to reproduce biomedical research, and so this is kind of a hot topic, and it's important. Uh, any of you who were here this morning at uh, Dr. Uh, Collins' presentation, this was the third item on his uh, point, and uh, this is an issue in the research community and in the public who uh, support us. So let's get a couple terms uh, going uh, resolved first. Uh, these these are from uh, some FASEP documents, and uh, sometimes you hear all these terms, but let's talk about what they really mean. First of all, replicabil replicability, and this is the ability to duplicate or repeat an experiment uh, using the same source materials and methodology. So this refers to specific experiments ra rather than an entire study. The next item is reproducibility, and <clears throat> this is uh, somewhat similar, but this term uh, really uh, is used uh, when specific findings from a study are obtained by an independent group of researchers. So for instance, you can have replicability for a smaller uh, set of data uh, or results, but reproducibility would be a larger thing. And then finally, uh, transparency, which is really somewhat different. This is reporting of experimental materials and methods in a manner that provides enough information for other people to independently or assess and reproduce your findings. So this is very important because this is how science works. If other people can't repeat uh, things, then uh, the whole system's not going to work. Some of the variations in experimental results uh, may be due, may, well, they may signal unexpected phenomena leading to new scientific understanding. Uh, and the lack of reproducibility, generalizability, and translatability are distinct from and don't necessarily imply error or scientific misconduct. But they are important, and uh, we're, uh, Dr. Colburn's gonna talk about uh, some of the issues uh, there. Uh, then it turns out that sometimes these exceptions and outliers, if you will, turn out to be really important and tell us something new about science. Uh, the, uh, but the, one of the problems is the inability to repro reproduce research findings in different laboratories may result from a lack of sufficient detail in the reporting of critical materials or methods. And this is really important. Those of you who are graduate students uh, uh, or postdocs, uh, there's nothing you hate worse than uh, if your advisor tells you to do an experiment that's in the literature and then you find out, uh, well, the paper didn't really tell you about this, didn't tell you about that. You go back to your advisor and he or she doesn't really know either and so it gets very difficult and you sort of have to guess. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So uh, all of this research, rigor, research, all research is really dependent upon adhering to good research practice, practices by all research team members and including but not limited to the principal investigators but also staff scientists, technicians, postdocs, graduate students, undergraduate students, core facility staff, and institutional leadership, and also journals and their editors. And that's why we're here talking to you today, because uh, we have to get involved in this, because it's, uh, it's important uh, for the journals uh, to uh, do whatever they
So let's talk about some things. I think these things are pretty important. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, some of these terms and basically uh, the, there's an issue and then how to avoid it. Plagiarism, you've probably all heard of plagiarism. They, even, they probably even talked about that in your English class in high school probably. But don't use another person's text, figures, graphs, or data without attributing it uh, to that author. Uh, how to avoid that? Well, be sure to cite work from other sources. That is, if you use a statement uh, from uh, somebody else, uh, put quotes around it and indicate where you got that. Self-plagiarism is basically reusing data from your own previously published paper, and believe it or not, that does happen. And the whole point is that all data are new and original for each paper, including control experiments. And if you do use something uh, you used previously, be sure to uh, cite that as such uh, as instead of pretending it's new. Falsification of data. This is getting more serious now. This is a matter of manipulating data so that the published figure doesn't uh, necessarily match the original and we'll be showing you some examples of that. So uh, we'll get into that with gels and spectra as well in uh, momentarily, but basically don't change anything, and uh, in if you do change anything, indicate what you did. It may or may not be okay, and this is very important. If you don't remember anything else today, remember to hang on to your original data because it's extremely important, and uh, those of you who go out into the uh, into industry, let me get in there. Okay, um, and you'll find that this is extremely important because it gets involved in things, uh, for instance, the pharmaceutical industry, whether you can get your drug approved and patent litigation, things like that. They go back to your original data and uh, somebody may be sifting through that in great detail. Okay, fabrication of data, making up data to improve the experimental results. And I'm not going to go through a lot of examples. There are a number of things in history. This isn't new. Um, it happens every now and then. There have been some notorious cases of people painting black spots onto white mice and then pretending that they were hybrids and things like that. Uh, the Make sure that your results are accurately represented. Um, uh, then basically the answer is don't, the simple uh, thing to say is don't cheat. Uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, if you have any actual or perceived conflict that could affect scientific judgment, uh, declare it, make certain that there are any affiliations, financial relationships, personal relationships, anything else that could be uh, perceived as influencing an author's objectivity. And then we're not going to really talk much about animals uh, here, but if you're doing research with animals, it has to be done in a transparent manner, and research has to be reviewed and approved by an institutional animal care uh, committee, so consult the guidelines uh, in that regard. Uh, the let's see, that's actually carrying over from the previous one. Okay, another thing which occasionally we have to get involved in is authorship issues, and that is adding, deleting, or changing the order of the authors. It's very important that you agree on authorship before writing the manuscript. And uh, basically at the JBC, when you submit a paper, uh, it is with the agreement uh, and there's a box to check with the understanding that all of the authors have seen this and approved of everything in the manuscript, including the or order of the authors. And also authorship is based on substantial contributions. Uh, another problem, uh, we don't have too much, we haven't had this very often, is duplicate submission, but it can happen. That is submitting a manuscript or parts of, major parts of a manuscript to more than one journal. Uh, so uh, basically if you're in a situation, withdraw a paper or wait until it's declined before submitting to another journal. Uh, you're not going to save any time by submitting twice, uh, so don't get any bright ideas about that because you're probably going to get in a lot of trouble. 
So uh, I've gone through these and what are the consequences? I'll talk more about this at the end of my section, but violations of these policies may result in delay of publication, retraction of the article, or notification of your institution. So uh, there's a site here at uh, jbc.org, and I'll go through that later in terms of some of the things we have to do sometimes, but these take these things very seriously because they are serious. One of the things I'm going to talk about briefly, and then uh, Kara is going to talk about it some more too, is image processing. Uh, images are very abundant today. We have some amazing things we can do uh, in the digital age uh, nowadays that we n never used to be able to do, but they're data and uh, they should be minimally processed. Uh, there are some amazing things you can do nowadays with pictures and things like that. I'm into photography and I use something called Lightroom. This is outside of the science and it's really great, but, and that's fine for pictures of mountains and things like that, but don't do that with your data. If an image must be processed, the original unmanipulated image must be retained uh, because we may have to ask you for that. Uh, and also another point, on instruments, uh, some of the settings can be used to compromise image data uh, and so be very careful about this because you can basically change that and give a misleading picture of what the data really represent. So uh, when we're talking about image manipulation, this falls into mainly three different categories. Uh, there are probably more possibilities too. There are different criteria for what constitutes as in, uh, something as being inappropriate, and they're editing, grouping, and adjustment. So the policy, policy our policy on editing, uh, is that no specific feature within an image within an image may be enhanced, obscured, moved, removed, or introduced. So this, when I say no, I mean no. Uh, and immunoblots uh, are wonderful, uh, the, we, uh, but don't crop those in a way. They need to retain the information about the size of the antigen and the antibody specificity. Here's some original data, and you can sort of see this wart or bleb on this cell. Uh, so don't take that off. It might be important and maybe meaning something, uh, so you can't just take things off because you don't like them. That's really cheating. And here we are with uh, immunoblots, uh, or very often called Western blots, if you don't know what an immunoblot uh, means. Uh, these should be cropped in a way that retains information about the antigen size and antibody specificity. So they should still have uh, area around the bands of interest, including the positions of at least one molecular weight marker above and below, that means two. So here's our original data. This is what you'd get in the laboratory and you crop that, but here you have one band above, one below. This is not acceptable because we don't really know where this came from, it might be from something down at the bottom that isn't really the right thing. So if this is uh, 45 kilodaltons and this is 60, then we'll know that this is about 50, but this isn't uh, terribly useful. So this is what's acceptable. Another uh, problem is grouping, as I said. The grouping of images from different parts of the same gel fields or exposure must be made explicit by the arrangement of the figures. That is using dividing lines. I'll show you some examples here. And also uh, in your legend, that is the text of the figure, reflect that the images have been grouped, okay? So here we are back at these uh, gels and here's original data. You get one of these and one of these. And you can put these together, for instance, to facilitate comparison, but you have to draw a box around these because it's not acceptable as showing that these are naturally close to each other. So basically, uh, and I think uh, you should also, in the text of the figure legend, say what you did. So again, don't be doing anything too uh, exotic here.
Splicing is something we often see problems with, and splicing should be used only if it's essential to remove lanes from the original block for whatever reason, um, and splice positions must be clearly indicated and explained in your text legend too. So here's the original data. This is something you uh, got in the laboratory, and that's what it looks like, but you don't really want to use all of it for whatever reason, so uh, basically Basically, if we want to use this part and this part and not the part in the middle, uh, then we uh, put these together and we draw a line here, explain what we did. It's not acceptable to fuse these together because that isn't the way they were done uh, in the uh, electrophoresis uh, apparatus. And splicing should never be used between different blots. That is, uh, you know, take this and this and put them together uh, in a way that indicates that this was one real experiment. In fact, this is a really bad job. Even from here with my eyes, I can actually see this line in the middle uh, too. And so, and here, don't do it this way. Basically, you actually have to show these as separate gels. Now, adjustments. Um, the, I already showed you examples of how one could, uh, the problem one could have. Basically, if you're going to adjust brightness, contrast, or color balance, they have, you have to do it the same way to every pixel in the image. That is, the whole image has to be uh, adjusted. You can't just do parts of it. And if you do some nonlinear adjustments, uh, then you must disclose those in the figure legend. That is, different sensitivities or whatever, because it can be really uh, seen as bad. This one may be not quite so obvious here, but this is an inappropriate adjustment. Adjustments of brightness, contrast, and color balance are acceptable, but they have to be applied again to every pixel in the whole image. That is, I have to do it to everything here, not just to part of it to uh, make this uh, better. Okay, and here's another example. I think this is pretty obvious in terms of what not to do with a uh, uh, immunoblot, western blot, and well, I guess I think this is a blot, and uh, it, it could be just flat out uh, gels too. But anyway, here's the original data. And, yeah, you can see this is kind of ugly. It's got a bunch of warts and pox everywhere and things like that. It's got some extra bands up here, so you can adjust it somewhat. Here, we're still showing everything like that. This is too much contrast because now things have uh, disappeared and now I'm down to, for instance, um, well, there are really only about three proteins, you'd think, and that's not really true. There, you got rid of all the junk here, and so that's inappropriate. That's too much contrast uh, there. And so, okay, so, um, these things are related to gels and uh, pictures of cells and things like that, but uh, even in chemical things there are problems. And uh, we have had so far only one potential issue with a mass, some mass spectral data. Uh, it turned out it wasn't really a problem when I analyzed it in more detail, but I know that uh, uh, chemical journals have had issues with M NMR spectra quite often. There are gaps in the baseline, th whoops, things like that, suggestive of erasures. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues uh, called some of these things to my attention that have uh, appeared in, um, uh, I won't go through which journals, but you can see here somebody whited out a peak and so you can actually, this is actually pretty obvious because now there's a gap in the baseline. Same thing over here. And also the detection uh, software can actually pick those up. Uh, indi it'll indicate that the baseline doesn't really match the rest of the baseline. So uh, it, there are many different types of data in which uh, one can actually have problems. Here's another issue and that is in the reuse of images that represent the same experimental conditions in more than one panel or figure. This is highly discouraged and if you do this it has to be disclosed and well justified. So quite sometimes we've seen things like uh, for instance uh, oh, uh, uh, a housekeeping uh, gene expression something like GAPDH or something like that. Uh, 
being used uh, that as a control loading control for multiple things uh, and that and that's not really appropriate and we we can catch this Keru uh, uh, shows up as being pretty obvious so uh, these um, examples are not limited to immunoblot microscopy images as I showed even you can cheat on NMR spectra or you can try to cheat uh, you'll probably get caught uh, or mass spectra too. So it applies to a lot of things anytime there's an image. Okay, so I've tried to indicate you, to you that this is actually pretty serious. So what are the consequences? Well, any allegation of inappropriate image manipulation will be investigated. Uh, at the JBC, we don't check every manuscript that comes in, but we do uh, check some, and I won't go into why we do it, but if there's any, uh, uh, during the review, for instance, any suggestion that something might have been manipulated, uh, we'll check it out. So uh, we'll investigate it, and manuscripts containing violations may be rejected without any further review. Uh, this is in our instructions, and it's pretty important. And also, even if you get your paper published, uh, and, we, and we find out there's a problem later, uh, uh, this might be retracted. And institutional officials may be notified of articles with manipulated images. So uh, you can't see this very well, but basically your paper that has been published on the web and everything will now have a big sign on it that says retracted. So you don't want that to happen. Uh, because uh, basically if you're trying to get a job and you have a bunch of papers on your CV and somebody goes to look them up and one of them has this big stamp on, uh, that's probably not going to help your chances of getting a job, frankly. Uh, and so basically here's a website that you can go to to see what some of our policies are. So uh, I think this is my last slide. Uh, again, here are some websites, and by the way, if you uh, can't write these things down fast enough, you can always find them, uh, search through uh, www.jc.org and find all of these things. And the other thing is we are going to make uh, this material from today available uh, broadly, and uh, so you'll be able to come back and look at them. So we have a policy on image manipulation, policy on preparing figures with immunoblots, and policy on microscopic imaging uh, data. We're not inclusive. As I mentioned, uh, there are even problems sometimes with chemical spectra, but uh, we don't have a, we, I think uh, some of this is kind of obvious. So that's all I have. Uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, uh, Associate Editor Roger Colbrun and um, he'll talk about uh, some other things and then we'll come back and uh, answer your questions later.